In this skill station, we're going to talk about bleeding control and shock management. One of the things that you've got to realize is that people are going to bleed. And even though it may not seem to be an emergency to you, it certainly could be an emergency to them. And because of that, they could go into shock very, very easy. For this scenario, we're going to simulate that a patient has kind of lost their foot in a motor vehicle accident. We're going to need to apply a tourniquet, control the bleeding, and manage that patient for shock. As you come into the skill station, you're going to make sure that you need to have all the equipment necessary. For this station, you need to be able to make sure that you have something to keep the patient warm to manage the shock. You're going to need to make sure that you have some type of bandaging to control bleeding. Of course, you want to have your stethoscope in case you need to listen to breath sounds or take vital signs. You're going to need a splint. We have the FAST1 splint that we're using as part of our course. And of course, you're going to have to deliver a high concentration of oxygen, so you need your oxygen bottle with flow meter and your non-rebreather. As you come into the skill station, you need to go ahead and verbalize and show that you're wearing your personal protective equipment. Remember, as part of our skill station, you can never simulate personal protective equipment. You need to be wearing it at all times. This way it gets you into the habit of saying it and knowing it that you have it on and ready to go. So what we're going to do now is we're going to simulate that a patient has lost their foot secondary to a motor vehicle accident. One of the things that you want to be able to do is apply direct pressure right away. Now, how do you apply direct pressure? You can do this a couple ways. If you know that you're going to be placing any type of bandage or any type of splinting, if you need to apply direct pressure, you can do it right away with your gloved hand. Do you really need to have a bandage to do that? No. If you do have a bandage present, you want to go ahead and open it and you want to go ahead and apply it to the wound. And one of the things that you need to know is this may become blood soaked very, very quickly. What you don't want to do is you don't want to lift the bandage up to put a clean one on top of it. Just take a clean bandage and put it on top. If any clotting is going on and you happen to lift that bandage up, you've now just destroyed that opportunity for clotting. So go ahead and apply direct pressure. If you need to, continue to apply direct pressure. Now this may be a skill that you'll need a couple hands to do. So you may want to pass that off to your partner so he can continue to hold direct pressure as you're applying the tourniquet. As we go ahead and apply the FAST1 system, you'll notice that there, there's a couple different gadgets on here that's going to keep you in a position to, uh, you know, kind of wonder what's going on here. And we're going to kind of talk about this a little bit more as we talk about putting this device on. The spindle that you see here, you're always going to want to keep to the top. So as we put this on, remember the person has lost their foot, we want to go above where the bleeding is, whether it's a severe bleeding, a severe break, whether it's an amputation, we want to go above that. We want to go ahead and pull the tourniquet as tight as we can. And we want to go ahead and make sure that we make the Velcro attachment. The next thing that we want to do is we want to take the spindle and we want to go ahead and turn that one or two rotations until you can see the oozing or you can see the spurting of the blood stop. As you spin the spindle, go ahead and slip it in its little holder, Velcro it over, and now you have your tourniquet in place. One of the things that you need to think about now is, is the patient in the right position? Do you need to put them on a backboard? Do you need to uh, get somebody to help you lift them to the stretcher? How, how are you going to move this patient to the ambulance? The next thing we want to be able to do is put this person on a high concentration of oxygen. And of course, a high concentration of oxygen comes at 10 to 15 liters per minute, so you need to use that non-rebreather mask. We'll put the patient on oxygen. The other thing that we need to worry about now is the patient may be losing temperature. We want to be able to maintain the patient's temperature. We want to go ahead and cover them up, get them off the scene as quickly as practical, and get them to that trauma surgeon as fast as you can. Because you really now need to start thinking about a transport decision and getting them off the scene as quickly as possible. Because what this person needs is a trauma surgeon, and you need to get them off the scene as quickly as possible.
Now that you've been through the skill, let's take a look at the critical criteria for this skill. When you're participating in a skill evaluation, you will be given points for each of the steps of the skill that you complete. Note that failure to adequately complete any one of the critical criteria will cause you to fail that particular skill examination, regardless of your overall points scored. Go ahead and take out your National Registry skill sheet and follow along with me. Here's the critical criteria for this skill. Please remember that this video is intended to help you prepare for the National Registry Psychomotor Skills Examination and the approach may not exactly match protocols used in a different context. It's important, however, that you memorize each step of the skill in order. This way you're able to demonstrate the skill to your instructor, preceptor, and evaluator.